Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. After 68 years, the two Koreas are on the verge of signing a peace treaty. A Donald Trump, Kim Jong-un summit is in the works. Is peace coming to the Korean Peninsula? Well, it's possible. The foreign policy blob and the corporatist media are less enthusiastic. After all, conflict is their business model. Cross-talking the Korean Peninsula, I'm joined by my guest, Surab Gupta in Washington. He is a senior fellow at the Institute for China-America Studies. Also in Washington, we have John Merrill. He is former chief of the Northeast Asia Division of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. State Department, as well as author of Korea, the Peninsular Origins of the War. And in New York, we cross to Daniel Lazar. He is an author and freelance journalist who writes frequently about the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the U.S. Constitution. All right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in any time you want, and I always appreciate it. So, Rep, let me go to you first in Washington. Um, if you look at the mainstream media, and particularly the cable stations, all the focus on the, uh, on the um, Korean Peninsula is it, directed towards this, this uh, summit that uh, Trump may have with the North Korean leader. But really, I think it's what's more important is happening this week, and it's the two Koreas coming together. How does this change the situation on the peninsula if North Korea and South Korea can find some kind of meaningful, and let me stress, meaningful rapprochement? Go ahead in Washington. Uh, let me, in response to your question, lay it out right away that the real credit for uh, the, what the situation, the, the, the opportunity that we have today is because of President Moon Jae-in in South Korea. You know, if we had a, the same old conservative South Korean government in place today, what would have happened is uh, Kim Jong-un would have gone through with his condensed testing schedule and then after that he would have gone straight into his bunker emerging from time to time with grave threats and, and snarly gnarly threats to, to, to blow everything up. The fact of the matter is that Moon Jae-in is the person who has been able to tease Kim Jong-un uh, Kim Jong -un out into the sunshine and has opened and shown him a pathway to global integration and as well as north-south reconciliation. Moon Jae-in, the South Korean progressive government has led this process of, of reconciliation which has dramatically altered the dynamics on the, on the Korean peninsula. Of course the Olympics also have helped and therefore it is North and South the extent that they lead the process, that they will drag the other parties along, including the United, United States. States. So the real okay. credit lies with the peninsula parties. Okay, John, let me go to you. More or less the same question here, because the dynamic changes considerably. If there is a peace between the two Koreas after 68 years, um, they start coming to some kind of uh, defense and security measures that both can accept. Then regime change, as it were, that we hear so many people talking about in in the Washington foreign po policy blob, that kind of is taken off the table because that would not be in South Korea's interest. Go ahead, John, in Washington. Right, Peter. Well, I think, I think you overstated it a little bit. Uh, I, I do give President Moon a lot of credit, but I think the main credit, and I never thought I would say this, I know probably <laughs> belongs to Donald Trump. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, this, 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 is, this is the man who said he, he, he wanted nothing more than to sit down and have a hamburger with Kim Jong-un. And it looks like he's going to get his chance. Right now, uh, they're, they're, they're apparently still uh, CIA people, liaison people, behind in, in Pyongyang, at least according to the South Korean media. And uh, people are hard at work. And uh, Mr. Pompeo is the guy that's been running this. Um, uh, formerly from his post as uh, CIA director, but hopefully in a few days as Secretary of State. So I think I, I would agree that President Moon deserves a lot of credit, and certainly with a progressive government, a lot of things are possible yeah. that weren't under past con uh, conservative regimes. But I think we have to give President Trump his due as well. Sure. And uh, 
I, I just I just hope things go okay. It's a topsy well, topsy turvy world right exactly. now. Exactly, and and you know, and I'm very happy that this process is going on. Let me go to Daniel. I don't care who gets the credit. I think that is really low on the hierarchy of a, of importance here. Getting peace on that peninsula where you have the most uh, heavily armed border in the world after 68 years, we, uh, the considerable American military uh, presence is there, um, and the Chinese have come in in in, in ways that I think we'll find out in the future. They were very constructive here. It's the result that counts, most importantly. Go ahead, Daniel. Well, <clears throat> let me speak up for Kim Jong-un, okay. <laughs> who I think has played his cards extremely well. Uh, um, this is not an a political endorsement of him by any means, but he is a very smart yep. uh, player. Yep. Uh, and he has uh, done a very good job. Yep. Uh, he's, um, you know, he sort of he kind of uh, you know seize control of the opening, seize the opening that uh, that that Trump uh, courted him, uh, and has really run with it. And I think it's a it's a pretty impressive uh, performance. Okay, uh, let's go back to Washington. Uh, so, uh, so to, uh, I, I think what's really important here, I mean, it's good to get down to really the details here because we have a denuclearized South Korea. I, I'm sorry, Korean Peninsula. That means North and South. So that means that American nukes would not be allowed there. I mean, this is the kind of opening that I think the North Korean leader was looking for. He's looking for a grand bargain. And you know what, folks? He's been asking for a grand bargain for a while. And I think he had to go through all of the theatrics of the missiles and the launches and you know all of the uh, heated rhetoric back and forth this was the opening that he was looking for and it was a South Korean leader that opened the door and we got a nod from Donald Trump I mean we'll find out where it goes so um, you know it really gets down to the details of what that means because we know all along North Korea wants security guarantees maybe Russia and China can be guarantors of that go ahead sort of in, in Washington yeah, 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 absolutely correct on that. I mean, the, the real devil is in the details in terms of how do you go about uh, staging nuclearization in terms of how that process works out, the mechanics of that process. Uh, but you're absolutely correct on that point with regard to denuclearis denuclearization, that it is not just a North Korean affair. It needs to be a peninsula affair. Let me throw out a, a, a useful principle which might be useful out here both in terms of denuclearization as well as in reduction of conventional forces uh, in terms on the peninsula and in terms of the hostilities that are there. In terms of denuclearization, we're talking, of course, complete, verifiable, irreversible de denuclearization of North Korea. They can have a civil nuclear program, which can, uh, civil nuclear program, which will be very intrusively watched over by the IAEA, full scope, safeguards, etc., etc. But what that means for South Korea is that, uh, of course, they have their civil, a very extensive civil nuclear program, but there will be no strategic forces on their territory, and there won't even be an extended deterrent for, to South Korea provided by the U.S. so long as there is complete uh, denuclearization of the North. Now, the parallel fact which North and South Korea, frankly, need to work out because denuclearization is essentially a topic of discussion between uh, North Korea and the United States with right. regard to conventional forces, what the, the, the disposition at the end of the day needs to be that the peninsula is, is kind of insulated from larger geopolitics of right. Northeast Asia. South, South Korea has already shown that it is not, in, not terribly interested in getting into things like a regional ballistic well, missile shield. Well, it's well, not interested yeah, in we're a gonna, trilateral alliance. We're going to find out so just how, yeah, we're gonna yes. find out just how far uh, the, pe the Pentagon wants to go along with it. Sean, let me go to you because if you again if you look at the mainstream media yeah. and the punditry that we were bombarded with all of the time uh, the mainstream media is really not on board here is it just because they don't want to see Trump succeed at anything or in the military industrial complex I mean South Korea and the and that region of the world is a nice um, uh, uh, trough for, for arms and, and uh, you know the US has a vast military establishment there that needs to be paid for I mean right. is it a combination of these things here Go ahead, John, in Washington. Well, you know, I, Peter, I don't know. That's, uh, that's, that's kind of hard to say. What, what I will say is this. I think what, what has happened is that we have now gotten a de facto freeze for freeze. This was the proposal yep. that was made by Moscow and Beijing years ago. And uh, 
I, I wrote a, an op-ed on, on a subject uh, about a year and a half ago, and I got excoriated yeah. uh, for saying that. But this is, what is, this is what is now de facto in place. And so this is, uh, this is a big deal. It is and, a big uh, deal. You know, the U.S. The, the U.S. military exercises this year, the joint uh, U.S.-ROK exercises, are a, sh a, sh a shadow of their former self. Last year, we had three aircraft carrier battle groups participating. This year, it's one uh, small aircraft. It's really an assault ship with uh, short takeoff and landing J uh, F-35s. So it's, it's a huge deal. Now, there are huge military asymmetries on the peninsula, which are going to be astronomically difficult to resolve so we may get uh, a start uh, in these in these discussions when the two korean leaders may meet they may in a few days they may even declare an end to yes. the korean war at least hostilities but it's going to take a lot of tough slogging to work through some of these details and to particularly to put in place the security guarantees which i think the north koreans are going to insist on to go forward. Daniel, let me go to you. I mean, security guarantees, that's what it's always been about. And I'm glad that John mentioned the freeze for freeze because that's been around for a while. Nobody in the mainstream media says that, where that idea comes from. But I can tell you, if you go to last year during the Security Council, you could see the Russian and the Chinese ambassador at length go through that, uh, that uh, um, process here. Daniel, before we go to the break, go ahead in New York. Oh. <clears throat> I just want to remind uh, your, your viewers that, uh, that in 2002, uh, George W. Bush virtually declared war on North Korea, uh, which he somehow blamed for 9-11. But North Korea was, uh, was one of the three countries comprising the so-called axis of evil. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, invaded one of those countries, has, uh, you know, has been sword rattling at the other ever since. And so North Korea had, you know, had grave concerns regarding its own security. So uh, Kim Jong-un uh, figured his only protection lay in a nuclear, nuclear weapon, okay. which he has Daniel, built, and Daniel, he apparently has... Let me jump in here. Hold that thought, gentlemen. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the Korean Peninsula. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing the Korean Peninsula and the possibility of peace. Okay, let's go back to Daniel in New York. You were taking us down history lane. You were, you were just talking about uh, the Axis yeah, of Eagle. Yeah. But pick up from there. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, well, so, so in 2002, with his Axis of Eagle speech, uh, George W. Bush essentially declared war on North Korea. And that, that speech has never been uh, rescinded in any way. There's been no, no apology issued, no, uh, you know, no taking back, etc. cetera. So, um, so, so Kim Jong-un figured quite logically that its only protection lay in having a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. capable of striking the, uh, the, the United States mainland, uh, which he apparently has achieved. Um, so that is, his, uh, that is his, um, his, great, you know, his great chess piece, his ace in the hole. Uh, and I don't think, I will go on a limb here, but I really doubt that he will agree to full denuclearization uh, unless the U.S. meets him, you know, is, and willing to engage equally yeah. uh, in an equally grand gesture, which Trump might be willing to do, but I can guarantee the rest of the foreign policy establishment, or blob, yeah. Yeah. as you call them, will not. They will raise holy hell, and they will essentially block Trump from doing that. Sort up in Washington. Go ahead, reflect upon that because that's been Ooh. my inkling from all along. You know, um, I'm like John said. I'm I'm perfectly will, willing to give Donald Trump uh, credit for this if this is you know, kicked it off. Okay, fine. Okay, but. There are forces, and you see it all the time, uh, and, and the corporate media mimics the, the, their corporate um, uh, owners, okay? They're not keen on seeing uh, peace breaking out, particularly if it means negotiations as equal. That's not in their DNA. They don't operate that way. Go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely correct. First, let me back up a little bit out here and say that, yes, I totally agree with John that a huge amount of credit is also due to, uh, to Donald Trump. Because let us remember, before he talked about fire and fury and destroying North Korea, he also probably went 
uh, further than any U.S. president had 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 talked about and talked about particular some assurances. We he doesn't seek the collapse of the North Korean regime. He doesn't seek regime change. He doesn't want to have an invasion over the 30th over the 30th parallel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he has tried. He had made a lot of assurances also in his early months, and that has that that has he has not got adequate credit for that. So yes, I mean in other ways also Donald Trump deserves credit, and that's that's. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, the one really good thing going for Donald Trump is that the U.S. system provides huge, in, on foreign policy, huge amount of power, not just to the presidency, but to the president. And so he can really override his staff because, frankly, this is all going to come down to Donald Trump and making that deal with Kim Jong-un, which the foreign policy establishment has not been willing to contemplate. And part of the reason it's not been willing to contemplate Contemplate. It's easy to say that oh, the Kim regime forever. Uh, the, the the Kims never uh, never uh, on their from their part are always cheating, etc., etc. Which is which is not entirely true. It is partly true, not entirely true, but. Just too many forces, I think, uh, people in Washington are vested in a Cold War mindset, confrontational attitude to Northeast Asian geopolitics with the 38th parallel being that tripwire. And it's not easy for many of them to come to terms okay. that, you well, know what, the well, peninsula could be just insulated from that whole geopolitical yeah. environment. Well, let's ask John, because John, that was his line of business for a while. I mean, what are the forces yeah. moving against? this here um, beyond because it's just Donald Trump's idea but I mean the you know talk through the the bureaucratic inertia that you know that would be against this go ahead well I think I, I, I would disagree uh, I, I think that currently the top leadership of the US Defense Department is not against what Trump is trying to do and we just saw that in Syria. We saw that uh, DOD weighed in, and so we had symbolic strikes against Syria rather than uh, the uh, more far-reaching operation that some were advocating. So uh, I, I, I think that we have to be a little bit careful here. Now, I, I would take this back even a little bit before the axis of evil speech, uh, people forget that nuclear weapons were first deployed on the Korean Peninsula during the Eisenhower administration. And uh, we had at one time 950 nuclear, tactical nuclear wow. weapons in Korea. This, wow. is, this is now a decline. Well, we had 7,000 in Western Europe. Uh, anyway, um, uh, President Bush the Elder, who's now ill in the hospital, uh, was, the, was the one who decided to put an end to this, this kind of madness. And so we began withdrawing them. But, you know, you don't have to explain the nuclear issue in terms of the evil nature of the North Korean regime, although perhaps there's some of that that, uh, that can be uh, part of the uh, explanation. It's really an action-reaction sequence and we took the initial action and the North Koreans then responded to it. So I think the same dynamic can be used in the current circumstances in terms of confidence building measures and hopefully we can walk this back. I agree completely that uh, having a, 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 a progressive president in Seoul is a huge help yeah. and uh, I think China and the, the, the Russia can also help but uh, I think it's going to be really difficult to unravel this knot which, uh, uh, which we've tied ourselves up in, in on yep. the peninsula and these various asymmetries. Okay, Dan Daniel, I, this kind of leads to the, where I want to go in the program. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there's a, there's a sense that if, if the, the U.S., and in, in there's the perception of the U.S. backing down, the perception of the U.S. Um, uh, involved in a diplomatic process that would be deemed as appeasement here, that would have a ricochet effect through all of the other entangling alliances the U.S. has in the Pacific. Is this part of the, the thinking there? Because as John said, you know, to, to, to untie this okay. knot here, it, there's a huge ripple effect through the entire region. Go ahead, Daniel. That's totally true, totally true. And there'll be a huge ripple effect in Washington as well, where all these countries have their, have their interests, they have their ties, they have their, you know, their little uh, their alliances. 
uh, Japan most particularly, yep. uh, but Russia and China as well. So if, if um, you know, and so and and the North may be playing a kind of a Vietnamese game where they're trying to. Um, you know, uh, seek a closer alliance with the South in order to protect themselves against China. Um, so therefore, that's certainly possible, and China could be getting nervous as well, and China has friends in Washington, too. And the, Jap very, and the, Jap happy to, and the uh, Japanese wouldn't be very happy the with, a, with a unified, strong, powerful Korean peninsula. And so, you know, that they would, their whole defense uh, uh, thinking and, would have to be uh, uh, rethought. Keep going, Daniel. And, and Japan has tons of friends in Washington also. So, so I think that we, you're going to see a huge ripple effect uh, from the, uh, the north, northeastern, uh, Northeast Asia you know, onto Washington, D.C., as all sides sort of pile on. And, you know, and Trump is, a, on one hand, Trump has got great power as a, as a U.S. president. But on the other hand, politically, he's very weak. Yep. Uh, he is really on the ropes. He's taking a, a ferocious pummeling. So, uh, so I don't know, I doubt very much that he'll be able to withstand these forces, and I think that he will, I'm pretty sure he is incapable of, uh, you know, of, of engaging in the same kind of grand gesture that Kim Jong-un is willing to engage in. Yeah, well, let me go back to sort of, I mean, you know, he won the presidency. He surprises us all the time. You know, maybe it'll work this time. I don't know. I mean, don't you think also it's just a mindset? I mean, North Korea is this cartoonish evil character, the axis of evil. I mean, it's so convenient. And there's so many people that have made entire careers out of demonizing. And I'm not, I'm not siding with the North Koreans or its leadership. I don't do that kind of thing. I, I'm basically uh, a a realist when it comes to foreign policy. So, but I mean, don't you think that's part of the problem here? Is just changing minds, you know, taking a fresh look. And there's like this really an amazing opportunity that we may never see again. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You, this is yeah, as good an opportunity oh, since the end of the Korean War in in. As since the end of the Korean War to have a peace regime on the peninsula, as well as since the denuclearization uh, declaration and agreements of the early 1990s to do denuclearization. Let me go out a little bit on a limb out here and, tell, and make two points. You know, with regard to denuclearization, most people, and I totally agree, understand their, their, their views that, oh, this is going to be very difficult, uh, close to impossible, he's not going to give it up. I'm one of those few, very tiny minority who believes that this is very doable and he I can agree. give it up I because agree. Kim Jong I Kim Jong Un is not in the same position as Saddam Hussein that's or why, Gaddafi. Th but that's think why, about it. That's why he developed it in the first place to trade it away for security guarantees. It seems logical to me. Exactly, and, and exactly. Let me explain that point also. You know what is a nuclear weapon? The, the the purpose of a nuclear weapon is to call unacceptable damage to the adversary. He already can do unacceptable damage to the adversary by trashing Seoul with his conventional guns, and therefore a nuclear weapon over above that is something that he can leverage and he can bargain and which is exactly what he is doing and therefore I would say that this is doable this is a great opportunity but what we have to do also is this cannot be a process which has strung out over many years and a decade and it's action for action with 500 steps which then breaks down after 20 steps this has to be a big grand bargain okay. done in a truncated way Let in me, a defined time period and I think okay. it's doable. Let me go let me go to John. John, you're on the negotiating team for the United States. What would you tell your boss, Donald <laughs> Trump, to do in 40 seconds? Go ahead. Hey, I, what I would tell him to do is just have good vibes uh, in, the, in the meeting. Uh, apparently, uh, that was the case when Pompeo went there. Uh, I think what's different this time around is that is the negotiations are not being run through a bureaucratic process. And a lot of people are criticizing Trump on this score. It's, uh, it's a crisis situation. And people forget what we were talking about last fall. We were talking about the imminent prospect of war on the peninsula. So I think things are moving in a good direction. I am concerned about the asymmetries. Uh, also, we're going to have one possible dropout in this process. Prime Minister Abe is in deep yeah. political trouble. Yeah. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to survive or not. But uh, 
Yeah, I think we uh, we just have to hope that the inter-Korean summit goes well. Okay. And that, uh, in a way, uh, well, Moon is no, playing the advance let, let, for Gentlemen, Trump. we've run out of time, and very rarely do we end on a positive note. Many thanks to my guests in Washington and in New York. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, crosstalk rules.